All right. Welcome to the tutorial for the 500 millibar chart. So my name's Jesse Ellis. I'm a fire weather forecaster, and over the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to be looking at what exactly is meant by the 500 millibar surface. I think it's really important to get a good picture in your head of what we're looking at when we look at the 500 millibar chart. The famous 570 line is a term that's thrown around on during most um, fire weather briefings, and Hopefully we'll be able to shed some light on what that is, what it can and can't tell us. And then we're going to look at how to identify upper ridges and troughs and link that into the kind of weather that we can expect on the ground. So before we start looking at any weather maps, I just wanted to cover a couple properties of the atmosphere. The first one being that with increasing elevation, it, the air pressure decreases. So we know this because we launch a whole bunch of weather balloons across North America a couple times a day to feed data into the weather models. And as they go up in elevation, so from the surface at zero meters, the air pressure is about a thousand millibars. So millibars are just a unit of air pressure. Millibars and hectopascals are interchangeable. When we go up to 1500 meters, the air pressure is about 850 millibars and the air pressure continues to go down uh, up to about 3,000 meters the air pressure is about 700 millibars. The 500 millibar level is somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000 meters and then by the time we get up to about 10,000 meters the air pressure is down to 300 millibars and this trend continues upwards from there. The reason I stopped at 10,000 meters is because most of the time the weather that we care about is only between the surface and about 10 kilometers off, off the ground. So as you may have guessed, we're going to be looking a little bit closer at the 500 millibar level. The other property of the atmosphere is something called the ideal gas law. And don't worry, I'm not a huge fan of equations myself, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on this one. The basic idea is for what we're looking at, um, if you keep the amount of gas and the pressure of that gas, that volume of gas, equal, so don't so the uh, the number of molecules and the pressure remain constant if you increase the temperature the volume of that gas will increase as a result so in other words if we have a column of air if we warm up that column it will become taller and vice versa the, um, if we cool off the column it'll become shorter as well so why did i choose column well i mean we can look at a pyramid of air you can look at a cube of air you can look at a sphere of air. It doesn't really matter the, the volume that you look at. Um, we're going to be looking at columns, and I'll, I'll show you why in a second. But the, the general idea is you increase the temperature, the volume will increase as well. And, <coughs> pardon me, this shouldn't be a surprise. I mean, it applies to liquids and solids as well. So this is why we want to look at columns, because if we, if we picture a column that goes from 1,000 millibars, remember more or less at the surface, up to the height at which the air temperature drops down to 500 millibars, we'll see that that column is about 5,900 meters tall in the warm subtropical regions off of the Gulf of Mexico here. If we go up a little further north, so we're off the coast of Vancouver Island from 1,000 millibars up to 500 millibar, that column is going to be about 5,600 meters high. And these numbers are, are variable. Um, over the Arctic, the 500 millibar height, so if we say the 500 millibar height, that's basically the elevation of the top of this column, is about 5,000 meters. So you can see we've got a range of about 20% uh, in terms of the height of the columns of air and how, how much they differ from the warm tropical regions to the Arctic. So that's, that's quite a big difference in terms of the, the height of those columns of air. So we're talking about 500 millibar heights Next we want to try to build a 500 millibar surface. So here's looking at a sort of a map view here. We've got that, that nice tall column off the coast of Mexico and a, a shorter one over uh, the Yukon here. And it, as it turns out you can measure the 500 millibar height pretty much anywhere. And if you get enough data points, if you measure the, the 500 millibar height in enough places, you can start to get an idea of what the 500 millibar surface is going to look like. 
And the 500 millibar surface is if you take all of these columns of, of air topped at about 500 milli at 500 millibars and you flop down a big sheet on top, a, a big, imagine a big massive piece of plywood on top of all of these columns, that is your 500 millibar surface. So now if we look at this from the top view, uh, we're looking at the exact same thing. I've, I've shown the columns of air here as numbers, so the, the height of those columns are here. So now we can get an idea of um, what this looks like in the map view. And in order to tidy this up, we can connect the, the dots, basically. So we're going to make, we're going to draw some contours on here uh, for places of equal 500 millibar height. And so we've got the contours on there. And now that we've got the contours on there, we can take away the data points and label the contours. So we're, we're looking at the exact same thing, just, just shown in a little bit tidier um, format here. And as it turns out, I'm not sh too sure why, um, on a 500 millibar chart, the 500 millibar heights aren't expressed in meters. For some reason, they say decameters. So one decameter is just 10 meters. So what we do next, we've got to adjust the units on here. So we'll get rid of these ones, put them back in, in decameters. All we've done is slashed off one zero from all of those numbers. So if you look at the 530 decameter was what we were looking at before as uh, 5300 meters. So um, now we've got something that looks pretty darn close to a 500 millibar chart. And if you look at the labels on here, voila, there's the number 570. So when, and I'll, I'll highlight that here, the 570 line is just one of those height contours for the 500 millibar chart. So areas that are south of the 570 line will usually see higher 500 millibar heights and areas to the north of the 570 line will see lower 500 millibar heights. So remember we've got those shorter columns of air across northern Canada here and we've got those taller columns of air uh, to the south. So who cares about the 570 line? Well, as it turns out, quite often the sensible weather is, um, there are relationships between the sensible weather at the surface and where the 570 line happens to be. Uh, entirely by coincidence, so it's, 570 is just one, one um, height line that was chosen arbitrarily there, but more often than not, you can draw some connections between the weather at the surface and where that 570 line is located. So here's an example. If you're on the coast of Alaska or BC here, if you look at where the 570 line is positioned, that's the one highlighted in red, areas north of the 570 line, so we're looking off the northern tip of Vancouver Island and northwards, are all under cloud, probably seeing quite a bit of precipitation up there and areas south of the 570 line are in mainly sunny skies and we'll see much warmer temperatures, lower humidities, all that kind of stuff. So in this case for the coast of British Columbia the 570 line works out quite nicely in in marking the, the dividing line between cloudy, cool and wet to the north and warm, dry and sunny to the south. Now does this always work? Absolutely not. So there, there are always exceptions to this rule. Uh, if you look further inland, we're looking over Montana here. Well, it's cool, cloudy, and there's probably some thunderstorms happening, and that's south of the 570 line. So just because you happen to be um, on one side or the other, doesn't it, it's not the end-all, be-all in terms of weather forecasting. So if we look, uh, this was a few days later, that big system is it has pushed inland a little bit. It's sort of dying off the, the, the uh, the coast of Alaska there. But if we look at the 570 line, and now we're going to look at an example for further inland, look at the, the Rockies. So we've got a bunch of convective cells, and if you're not used to looking at satellite pictures, that's okay. Um, but what we've got here is we've got a bunch of convective activity developing north of the 570 line along the Rockies, and south of the 570 line, so down in the uh, uh, southeastern corner of BC, that convective, there isn't quite enough moisture or else temperatures are, are a little bit too warm to allow uh, any of that cloud buildup. So the, this happened to work out quite nicely for this area on this date. Although, I mean, if you look back at Vancouver Island, 
we look at areas north of the 570 line on Vancouver Island for this day and there's pretty much a lack of cloud and it's probably warm sunny and dry there so it's like I said it's not the end-all be-all but it's not a bad first guess as to the kind of conditions to expect and it's a good a good control line to track over time so now let's look at some this is some something completely different we're gonna look at ridges and troughs and what I've brought up here is a I, I snagged this out of a geography 12 textbook and it's a topographic map with the topographic features labeled so if you're not accustomed to looking at topo maps this would be a great time to hit pause and go review that material because it's going to be pretty key um, for the uh, the rest of this tutorial so before I, I start marking up this map, I'm just going to turn it upside down here. Um, and this should be okay. I mean, no matter what angle you look at a topo map, a ridge is still a ridge, a trough, or sorry, a, a draw is still a draw, mountains are still mountains, lakes are still lakes. So I've just turned the map upside down here, and I'm going to label on here um, ridge lines. So we've got a ridge line extending northwards from this area of, of higher terrain or sorry, I shouldn't say northwards because I just flipped the map upside down. Um, we've got higher terrain across the bottom part of the map here and we've got a series of ridges radiating out towards the top of the map um, on here. Hopefully those are, are clear to you. And in between each one of those ridges, I'm, by the way I'm marching, marking the ridges with a zigzag here, in between each one of those ridges you've got a creek draw. I'll, mar I'll mark that with a, a dashed line. So we've got uh, ridges and, and draws radiating northward from this area of higher terrain across, I said northward again, radiating upward from the, the area of higher terrain across the bottom of the map. And we can draw a direct parallel between topographic features and features on a 500 millibar chart. Um, and I'll show you that right here. So here's our 500 millibar chart again. And imagine we're just looking at a topographic map with higher terrain across the south and, and lower terrain across the north. Remember we've got those short columns of air between the surface and 500 millibars across the north and those tall columns of air for the southern part of the map. And we should be able to, it should be um, easy to label the upper ridge that's extending from Mexico up over British Columbia here and then there's a, a an upper trough off coming down from the Arctic and over Newfoundland and Labrador there. So why do we call them upper ridges and upper troughs? Well, remember this is the 500 millibar chart, which is somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000 meters above um, mean sea level. So that's basically the only reason. It, that we're looking at five kilometers up in the atmosphere, and that's why they're called upper ridges and upper troughs. So here's a real scenario from a couple weeks ago. Um, we're looking at a 500 mil millibar chart of North America here. So this is the exactly the kind of thing that you're going to see in a fire weather briefing. And now would be a good time to hit pause and see if you can identify the ridges and troughs on here. So I'm going to start marking this up here. Uh, we've got an upper ridge extending from the northern Pacific here out over the northern parts of BC and and it sort of dies out as it gets up towards Northwest Territories there. And we've got a, a big deep trough coming in from uh, Alberta there over southeastern BC and extending all the way down to off the coast of uh, California there. Now what did this look like on this particular day? So it was winter time by the way and uh, oh here we go here's the 570 decameter line. So that's labeled on there it's the bold one here so we can highlight that and if you notice how far south the 570 line is. So we've got uh, the, the 570 line is all the way south of California. So from what we were looking at on the satellite picture, uh, we'd expect cooler temperatures, probably cloudier skies to the north of that. So this 500 millibar chart was actually um, taken off the internet on December 20th. So it, do, it, makes, it makes perfect sense that the 570 line is so far south where it was uh, the cool temperatures for all of BC. Now when we look at the features over British Columbia, this upper ridge that I highlighted here actually was, was bringing sunny skies and a little bit milder temperatures to parts of 
northern Vancouver Island and especially the north coast of BC, whereas this upper trough was producing isolated, scattered flurries and cloudy skies over pretty much all of southeastern BC. So what's going on here? When you have an upper ridge, it's a result of higher 500 millibar heights. And remember, those, f those higher 500 millibar heights result from a warmer air mass. And the best way to warm up an air mass is to heat the ground below it. And the best way to heat the ground below an air mass is to shine some sun on it. So upper ridges are often associated with sunny skies and warmer temperatures. If we look at an upper trough, that's the uh, opposite. So we've got lower 500 millibar heights. Um, a cooler air mass is why those heights are lower. And the best way to cool off an air mass is to not shine sun on it. Put some, have some cloudy skies, and uh, when you've got cloudy skies, you've got a better chance of precipitation. So I do want to highlight the fact that this is a very basic uh, conceptual model for what's going on in upper troughs and upper ridges. But for the sake of keeping it to 15 minutes, that's going to have to do for now. So what do we go over? We, we should have a better idea of what we're looking at when we look at the 500 millibar surface, which is called a constant pressure surface. The 570 line is, uh, is just one of those contour lines on that pressure surface. Should be able to identify ridges and troughs before you hear the fire weather forecaster say it during the briefing. And um, hopefully you've got a, a decent idea on a, at least a first guess of what kind of weather to expect under those different 500 millibar features. So if you have any questions, fire me an email. I'll make the time to, to find the answer for you. And the next question for, for me and probably for a lot of folks out there is what's next? And there's a lot, of, there's a lot more that we can get from the 500 millibar chart. One is the strength of the upper wind. So um, further tutorials I hope to, to put up here are going to cover how you can determine the strength of upper winds by looking at the 500 millibar chart also the direction of the upper wind. So why does this matter to us? Well, say you've got a fire um, and you're wanting to know what your afternoon winds are going to be. Well, oftentimes it's those upper winds that mix down to the surface in the afternoon that uh, are extremely important to, to how you're going to plan your day and tactics and all that kind of stuff. And another thing that you can, that you can um, gleaned from the 500 millibar chart is atmospheric stability and that's a that's a quite a complicated topic it, there's a lot to it and uh, I, I hope to be putting something up on atmospheric stability as well but that that one is key and um, when it comes to the the potential for blow up fires uh, atmospheric stability is is one of those factors So hopefully this was a help and uh, I'm looking forward to putting more stuff up, stuff up on here.